right. All right, so we're going to talk about classification and the scikit-learn library. So just to um, explain this for whoever might not be familiar with Python, um, first of all, uh, everyone in academia, everyone in just scientific research tends to use Python. And that's because it has great libraries for pretty much anything you want to do, like from astronomy to machine learning. So scikit-learn is a great library for uh, many of the more classical algorithms for pre-processing techniques for just like so much you're gonna learn by exploring because there's no way we we can cover everything scikit learn has on on the lesson so and additionally we're going to talk about classification which is a type of task we can perform with with machine learning so uh, for example the two main tasks are classification and regression can anyone tell me the difference between those anyone uh, know that already Yeah, as Ritter said, just if you can type it on the chat, just feel free to uh, to join in. And also interrupt me, interrupt me if um, if you want me to repeat something if I went over too fast. And yeah, exactly. Classification is discrete, so you you can have a few classes, and your answer will be within a few selected outcomes whereas regression lies on the continuous scope, right? So for example, if you're predicting house prices, then the house price is like any real positive number, right? And in classification, maybe you're predicting what type of animal it is. It could be a cat, a dog, but there's no in between cat and dog, right? Um, okay. So, yeah, scikit-learn, like I said, it's a Python library. You can just import it and use whatever is, has been done there. Most of the times, if you need to use an algorithm, you don't need to implement it from scratch because a lot of very smart people have done it already. And it's probably way better than, than you could do. Like they, they thought about every edge case, they optimized every, every like performance issue and most of the times you're gonna find what you need there. Okay, supervised learning, classification, and binary versus multi-class. So this, like the famous example, hot dog, no hot dog, that, that's binary, right? Like it either is or it's not. And there's a bunch of tasks that are binary. So to give a few examples like credit card uh, fraud detection. You know, like it's either a fraud or it's not. Um, and multi-class, the, the classical example of predicting image classes, predicting like animals, um, you have a bunch of classes and you gotta decide between those, right? And, and those are all supervised learning um, tasks because you can give clear labels of what things are and then the algorithms learn from your labels. Okay, so we talk about we talk a lot about models, and uh, to to people who are not familiar with ML or it's like their first time having contact with it, it it might not be too clear what a model is or like it takes us it takes stuff in and then spits stuff out. But we gotta define a few terms to to be able to work better with that because stuff is not good enough right so we have samples features and feature space um for me what helps me understand like the difference between those terms and like what everything means is to think about like an excel spreadsheet um like excel spreadsheets are very popular for a reason because they're useful and you can easily see all of your data and differentiate between it right so can anybody tell me within the context of an Excel spreadsheet, what would be a sample, what would be a feature, and what would be the feature space? Um, so a sample, I believe, would be one cell. 
and then a feature would either be a row or a column and then the feature space is the entire spreadsheet like all the rows all the columns taken together yeah cool so the sample exactly it's the cell um it's every example that you have on your data um or actually it's um it's just uh, like um, a row actually, right? Because you have one example and all of the variables that are described in it. So the, the features are gonna be the columns. So let's say we have, I don't know, like um, to go again with the housing price idea. Maybe you have a spreadsheet of a bunch of different houses and each row is a different house and then each column is things about the house. So maybe the square footage, the number of bedrooms, the number of bathrooms, the longitude, the latitude. So each column is gonna be a feature and each row is gonna be an example of a house. And, and the feature space is all of the dimensions that the data can take. So a lot of this is can be expressed as linear algebra and that's what the model understands right so when, when you take a linear algebra class it at least to me it sounded really abstract and i was thinking like when am i ever going to use this like this doesn't make much practical sense but for machine learning it's like crucial because you gotta communicate with the model somehow in a way that it understands right so each sample in that case would be the vectors you study in linear algebra. It's like, if you're a computer scientist, then that's the list. You have a different value for each um, dimension of the data, right? And then a feature space, if you have three columns, then you have a three dimensional data set. If you have two columns, then you can plot it out like we, like we see down here as a scatter plot and it's easy to visualize, but more often than not, we're going to be working with lots of features in, in a high dimensional space. Um, I don't know if like this was too clear. Please stop me if there's any question, but yeah. Okay, so now to a couple examples of models. This is by no means a comprehensive list of every model there is in, in scikit-learn. Um, it's just to give you a taste of like what a model is, like what, so what sorts of things you can do um, and, and to maybe uh, make it a, a little bit more uh, tangible and less abstract, this concept of model of like, maybe you, you put an input and you get a prediction, but like, how's that, that done, you know? So K-nearest neighbors is one of the most simple models you can have, basically, you're going to have your data, you're going to have your Excel spreadsheet, and you're going to have all your features and then a label, right? And then that label is going to tell you what class it is. So in the, in the case of the image, it's either a square or a triangle. And then what the algorithm does is whenever it sees a new data point, whenever it gets an input, it decides what class it is by looking at the k nearest examples and and counting how many of those are in each class so let's say um let's say we're considering this inner this inner circle then we have like this new data point and if we choose k equals three then we have a square and two triangles so that would be classified as a triangle um, the number k in this case is a hyperparameter. It's something user defined that'll affect how the model runs, the predictions it makes, its accuracy, um, um, precision, recall, everything. Uh, so, Nicholas? Yeah. So I have, a, I have a question for you. Could you clarify what's the difference between a parameter and a hyperparameter? Um, yeah. So. A hyperparameter, it's something that you specify for the model that, that's like very user defined in, and in this case, like the number, the number of points you're gonna use. And the parameter, it's something that's very, um, 
it's it's inside the model and it's something it's constantly um, calculating and updating and it the user doesn't have any kind of decision in, in how to tweak it and that's how the model learns so the parameters are going to be learned by the model in order to classify the points and the hyperparameters is something you give the model to tell it how to learn and Perfect. yeah thank you and in this case uh, another uh, something that helps to understand what's the feature space like how do you calculate the distance between points like if you look at this image maybe you measure like a straight line between them but what if it's in 10 dimensions that's where linear algebra comes in if you have um if you have like a, a 10 dimensional vector then you can calculate the distance between those vectors with a formula you learned in linear algebra or like there's a bunch of different ways to measure to measure distance and that's for another hyperparameter of this model for example Okay, decision trees. This is another classical model. And the basic idea is to ask questions and partition your data. So this image here is great. If you have um, an image class, maybe a classification task between different classes of animals, you can ask questions and further, like with each question, you get closer to to finding out what the class is. And a big thing about this algorithm is how you ask those questions. Um, the idea here is to ask the best question that will divide the data in the best way. And the way you can measure that is through criteria like Gini impurity, um, like that's a hyperparameter of, of decision trees. And yeah, and, and then Another thing that I think it's cool to talk about is what do you guys think happens when you have few data with models like that? Let's say you have a bunch of questions you can ask and you have a data set of 10 of 20 rows. Like what do you think might happen? Any guesses? Like Please don't be It'll afraid be to be wrong. Extremely large. So Sorry. It's like two to the power of twenty. Yeah, uh, like um, so you can grow. Hard to... You can grow an enormous tree, and maybe like if you don't stop it, it'll keep growing until each leaf is like a single example, and that's like not really optimal, right? Because there, you shouldn't be asking too many questions to figure out if it's a fish or a bird. So if you're asking that many questions, then that's a sign your model's wrong. And um, and you can tweak that with, with pruning, with just messing with the with the hyperparameters. And there's a bunch of, of things you can do. There's a name for, for this phenomenon. I'm gonna leave it till the end, but that's a big problem within machine learning. Okay, logistic regression. So this is a classic example. Um, okay, so just from the start, can anyone tell me like maybe why do we need logistic regression if we have linear regression? Maybe from looking at the at the images, maybe thinking about our discussion about um, classification and regression. Anyone maybe tell me like the difference between them intuitively? Um, if it's a discrete case, it's better to use logistic regression. Yeah, exactly. So, so why is that? Um, let's let's think about like if we're developing this algorithm. Um, oh wait, something said something in the chat. Algorithm will have less confidence. Linear model doesn't always work with certain data. Yeah, also also a big problem. So let's say we have so what what does linear regression do it, it'll make a line that best fits the the data points right but there's no restriction on how high or how low the the prediction will be so in this case let's say we have a single feature called x and then a prediction called y 
if it's a binary classification task, like those those data points, they might be classified as a million or negative 5,000. Like, how do we make sense of that? How do we draw a line and, and tell like, okay, this is this class and this is the other class. So logistic regression solves this problem. It'll fit a linear model and then apply a transformation to it. It's called um, sigmoid or logistic function. And it'll, it'll give us like this S-shaped function. And what is really nice about it is that it squeezes your, your output between zero and one. So you can interpret this as your confidence in a class. So if you give an input to the model and it says a half, it's like right in the middle here, then you don't really know what it is. If it's 0 0.9, then you're like 90% sure it's class one. Or if it's like 0 0.1, then you're 90% sure it's class zero. So that's like very useful for bounding the output of your model and, and differentiating bet between classes. Okay, and the last model we're gonna talk about today is Naive Bayes. Um, if you guys took a probability course, you probably have seen the uh, Bayes, Bayes theorem. And this is very cool. It basically, it's asking a very simple question. Given these features, what class is this sample? Which is like exactly what we need to know, right? And so what is it? What does it do to, to actually figure that out? It'll use like, so you, you give the data to your model and then it'll start counting like how many examples have the, like these features and were classified as this class. So in the end, what it's doing is just applying Bayes theorem and going reverse and, and asking, okay, so given this class, um, how probable it is that the, that how, how probable is the features I have, um, how probable it is, it is that a sample has the features I have, right? So it's asking the reverse question. So you do this two times. You do it for the positive case and for the negative case. So if you end up seeing that this calculation ends up being um, greater for the positive case, then you classify it as a one, if not as a zero. You basically do Bayes theorem for both cases and then um, see which which greater. And can anybody tell me like maybe what's the problem with this approach and maybe why it's naive? I feel like this one takes a little bit more time to, to wrap your, your head around it. Um, what what the, helped the me was- The assumption is that you assume the features are independent of each other. Exactly, exactly. And that's a very strong assumption to make, you know. Um, it, it's as though you're asking, like, um, if you you ask two questions about, about a, a certain sample, uh, if you ask, if you know something about this sample, then like the probability of knowing something else it's unaffected. So to give a concrete example, like let's say you have a bunch of animals. You have land animals and sea animals, right? So let's say you're fairly confident that the animal has paws, right? And then and then you ask the question, does it leave does it live on the sea? If you know it has paws, then no, it doesn't. Like what kind of sea animal has paws, right? So and, and this breaks the independence assumption. So like that, that's a, a flaw with this model, but it's still a, a highly, a very useful model. All right, so this is a recap of the, of the models we talked about. It was very like an intuitive approach. If you guys wanna know more about the math behind it, maybe you didn't understand it, maybe it was like too quick, I, I know like this, feels very overwhelming to just like see a bunch of models thrown at your face if you've never seen something like that 
but please like ask questions like reach out to us on on zoom on slack um we're here to help we're we're happy to help and yeah lastly i wanted to talk about the the, the problem of having too few data right um with decision trees for example when you reach the point where you're you're making a lot of splits and then at the end you have one class or in the case of naive base let's say you have too few data points and at the end the probability of of a feature gets messed up because if you have too few examples let's say like you have four examples total that are positive and then one example that has that feature and it's positive then the probability of it being positive given that it has a feature is a fourth right it's like one over four which like it's very few data to say it's 25 percent you know like it could be like 30 or 15 it could lie like on a finer spectrum and if you have too few data you're going to be missing that and big big problem with machine learning is it's just that it's called overfitting so yeah always like watch out for for what model you're using um and and how it fits your data that's why we have so many models and and they work differently because there's no best model there's no like one model that fits all it's all depending on how your data is dis distributed how many data points do you have what kind of features do you have if they're um if they're discrete or if they're continuous so um to give an example on this difference of features maybe you have like um you have a data set of flowers and you measure petal size and then like the petal size is going to be something continuous and maybe you also have colors and colors are going to be discrete it's going to be red blue violet something like that and different models treat this this information differently so it's always good to know your data and know different models so you can know like what to use best any questions and just a quick note about these models so so like nicholas said um this presentation was definitely made as targeting a high level abstract understanding of how these models work, not necessarily a deep low level um, implementation level detail. But I mean, these days, if you think about it and what we're about to do, you know, when we break out and work on the notebooks, you actually don't really need to know the implementation of a lot of the times when you can just plug and play. Um, but if you guys are curious and you wanna know more about how these actually work under the hood, I'm definitely gonna be sharing a supplemental reading document with links to different articles that we find really helpful. And you guys can definitely take a look at that for more information. Yeah. And then I think uh, last thing that I wanted to talk about, uh, a tip for you guys, there is no way you're gonna know every model and you're gonna know every hyperparameter and you're gonna know how every model works. So like even if you're a very experienced uh, machine learning researcher you're constantly reading through documentation you're seeing like what things you can tweak in each model maybe like why uh, a model is going to be better than than another one for a certain task and there's and the only way you learn this is by like going through documentation and and googling and like that's 99 percent of of like the learning with with what, what we're doing so like please like whenever you have a problem try looking at the documentation look at google stack overflow many people have had your problem already and there's like really good discussions about it yeah and i guess uh one last thing to uh, to talk about is hyperparameter tuning how do you choose k and knn how do you choose the maximum number of splits in a decision tree? Um, that's a big question because like we're we're having models to learn for us, and there's no way we know like what's the best thing for it to learn. So um, the way we do it is very trial trial and error. Define a grid, 
make a bunch of guesses of hyperparameters, maybe like, okay, the number of splits, I think it could be something between one and a thousand. Like, I, I'm not sure, it should be within that. So you try a couple of values in between, try a bunch of different, of different combinations of hyperparameters, something's gonna be good, hopefully. And like I said, scikit-learn has a bunch of uh, things already programmed for you. Grid search is one of them. It's already everything programmed. Just read the documentation, see how to use it, plug and play. It's very simple. And yeah, just test a bunch of different parameters, test different sets of the data, see what does best and, and go with it. By the way, um, it looks like Armand is raising his hand. So go yeah, ahead. Oh, a yeah. Question. Um, yeah, go ahead. Me jumping ahead or might not make sense, but um, so is it possible to kind of layer um, or kind of like fuse these different, uh, I guess, algorithms together? So for example, you were talking about with naive bias like, or Bayes, why it's naive. Can you do like a decision tree and then like, okay, if it doesn't have pause, then you do a naive Bayes with these other subset of, of features like is it possible to do that like yeah so um something uh you're very right like this is a very active field of research in machine learning and it's called like it's called ensemble methods so there's many different ways of combining those those different classifiers so let's say like you're not too sure whether to use one or the other or like there's like five types of classifiers that you think are well suited for the test and you can decide between them, then like the simplest approach you can take is to throw them all in a bag, see what they say, and then vote. So if out of those five, three said that it's a one and two said that it's a zero, then let's go with one. And like that's the, the most simple way. It's, um, it's called uh, voting. So just throw every classifier on a bag, vote, see what does best and go with it. Um, yeah, and then like you can get more sophisticated, like you could get a bunch of decision trees, put them together, randomize the features um, and build like different trees, average them out together and get a way more robust prediction. And that's another algorithm called random forests. So like there's a bunch of things you can do with with like mixing and matching these classifiers. Yep. Yeah, Armand, uh, what you just described, it's it's you're actually gonna gonna be able to see it in in the notebook when we when we work on it in a bit. It's uh, it's called ensemble methods, and that's exactly what you just said. It's using multiple classifiers, and then what Nico just explained, the one the where you just see which one was most popular, just like averaging, that's just, yeah, averaging or voting. Um, but then what you were explaining, that's called boosting, which is like you have one classifier, but then there's still some error. And so you have another classifier that takes all the uncertainty from the first classifier and kind of just incrementally improves upon that. So it's like stacking rather than just like averaging. But yeah, absolutely, that's the thing. Great question. Thank you.